there's no question that there's a fairly high attrition rate, and, and it's actually higher than seven to one. If you go right back to ideas, it's actually seven concepts for every successful, but ideas, it's more like 60 to one. Um, the first thing to remember is, is it's a bit like playing poker. Uh, when you sit down at the poker table and you start betting, you don't put all your money on the table. You put maybe two dollars or two euros and you get a few cards. And then you bet a little bit more money and you, and you get a few more cards and, and more information. In other words, new product projects, you never bet all the money at the beginning. It's a stepwise process. It's an incremental commitment. As you learn more, you bet more. So the first phase of a project may cost a few thousand dollars. The next phase may cost 10,000. The next phase may cost 50,000. But you never bet the full amount until you're ready to launch, go into full production, etc. And this is one way people mitigate risk. They, don't, they never eliminate risk. They manage risk. And, and doing it in an incremental fashion, which fits very well the stage gate process, of course, uh, is, is one way of, of, of managing risk, mitigating risk. And there's a number of other methods people use as well. Um, uh, they balance their portfolio. I mean, one of the, es the essence of risk management is having a balanced portfolio. Any stockbroker will tell you that. You do some high-risk projects, some low-risk investments. And that's another thing, and we talk about strategic buckets in that respect, about how to balance the portfolio optimally so that you have a reasonable risk, some high, some low, but just the right mix and balance. So there's a number of ways that executives can manage risk sensibly. You're never going to get rid of it. The only way to get rid of the risk is to get out of the game. And then you die another kind of death, but that you don't want to do. There are ways to manage the risk. So that's how you get executives to try to get into this bold innovation. There is risk, but you've got to take the risk. Yeah, because again, the evidence is very clear. The companies that have failed to innovate, that have uh, not spent the money, not taken the chances, they disappear. I mean, the history books of business are, re are full of stories of companies that failed to seize the opportunities that they should have because they were perhaps a bit timid, uh, didn't have the leadership at the top with the vision and the, and, and the fortitude uh, to take those chances. And, uh, and as I say, there are, you know, it's not an outrageous risk. Uh, there are ways to manage it. Stage gate's only part of it. Very often uh, a well-designed, uh, very often a process designed with the best of intentions uh, often ends up thwarting innovation because it's so cumbersome, so bureau bureaucratic, so painful to get through. And, and some people have told me privately in their companies because their process is so rigid and old-fashioned that it's stopping innovation. And I say, isn't that a shame because the original model was based on entrepreneurs and innovators. So you've lost something along the way. So the first thing uh, we're, we're always encouraging people is let's get back to basics here and, and let's make sure that the model that you're using uh, is true to the original concept of StageGate, an entrepreneurial guide for moving projects from idea to launch, not a paper form filling out exercise. Okay, guys, let's get back to basics on that. But, but more, companies have evolved the process uh, to make it, um, I, I use three A's here. You know, the first is to make it much more adaptive. Uh, in, the, in the old days, for example, uh, you typically um, would define the project and the product very early on. You got a product a definition, a set of specs, and then you would charge into development and develop the product and then get into field trials, and then everything would go wrong because it's not quite right, not quite what the customer wanted. Well, today we're talking a very adaptive process. Um, you build something very early on. You don't wait till after development. You start it even before development. Uh, a virtual product, a protocept, uh, a crude working model, uh, a cardboard cutout, uh, something that you can demonstrate to the stakeholders, to management, and also to the customers. You seek feedback. Uh, you, you basically make revisions. You, 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 so the whole thing is, is based on a series of spirals or loops. Build, test, feedback, revise. Build, test, feedback, revise. All the way through the process to get the product right and get it right early. 
before you spent a lot of money and gone down the wrong road. So the notion here is get something in front of customers early, often, cheap, and fast because people don't know what they're looking for until they see it. So get it in their face, get it in front of them. So that's one of the things, and that's a very adaptive process where the product evolves rather than is defined up front. Because defining it up front, usually it's wrong. And then you're faced with all kinds of problems later in the game. A second thing that we're, that we're seeing a lot of, a second A, is, is it's, 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 it's much more agile than it used to be. Uh, the, world, the software writers wrote the Agile Manifesto a number of decades ago, and they taught us a lot of things uh, about uh, uh, the emphasis should be on results, not on documentation. That, that you should break the process into a series of time box sprints of two, three, four, five, six weeks and produce something at the end of that. Well, software development is a lot different than physical development, physical product development, like a food product or a machine. So sometimes you can't translate all the principles into physical product development, but some you can. We can, we can break the development phase into a series of three-week or four-week sprints in which you have to deliver something at the end of that and not a PowerPoint presentation. We can, we can move, make the process be very nimble, moving from milestone to milestone all the way along. We can place a heavier emphasis on, on, on results rather than documentation. These are some of the lessons we learned from the Agile guys. And, and I, I think they can, people are building that into their stage gate processes. And finally, acceleration. That's the, th the third A. Uh, people are overlapping stages. People are uh, uh, making the process uh, much more context-based, meaning you don't use a big process for a small project. You know, we've got our big process for our big projects. We've got our medium-sized process for extensions, modifications, and fixes. And we've got our two-stage, two-gate, small, uh, lightweight process called StageGate Express. These are the, pro these are the salesman's projects, Salesforce projects, and they move through very quickly. So you don't use big processes for little projects. doesn't mean you bypass the process altogether. So people are doing that. And, and there's a number of other things that people are using to accelerate the process. Uh, the use of lean approaches, Lean Six Sigma. Uh, great methodology for improving the way the factory operates. How about improving the way product development is done? Every time we've uh, applied value stream analysis to the innovation process, we're able to cut out all kinds of, of time and all kinds of waste in the process. If it doesn't add value, get rid of it. Value stream analysis, a great way to do this. And so people are trying to accelerate the process by making it leaner, by making it context-based, by overlapping stages and activities. That by, and, and also, one more thing I should point out, since I know who you work for, by introducing automation. Because IT support of the StageGate process and portfolio management does, in fact, and has been proven, to accelerate the process considerably. Portfolio management, particularly strategic portfolio management, uh, is a very important component of bold innovation um, because strategic portfolio management really starts with strategy. Uh, where do we want to focus? And, and too many companies I go into are focused in areas where there isn't much opportunity where they are not going to find the engines of growth. And, and so the first issue is where do we want to focus? What are the playing fields? The hunt for the oasis rather than the sterile desert. And, and, and once we've decided that, and that's a tough exercise, but until you've d decided that, then you can't really do, then, then you can, once you've decided that, then you can move into portfolio management because then the next question is, okay, we've identified two traditional areas, two new areas. How much money do we want to put into each? Do we want to put 50% of the R&D into these two new areas or 10%? And that's strategic buckets, and that's part of portfolio management. So once the big boss, or big bosses, plural, have decided that, that these are areas that we want to focus on, the next issue becomes what resources, how much resource do we want to put against these new areas. Um, and, and another part of strategic buckets is, is the breakdown of project types and mix. What proportion of our resources do we want to put into bold innovations? normal new products, 
extensions and modifications. Very, very small changes. Do we want 25, 25, 25, 25? Or do we want to put 50% into bold innovations? That's part of portfolio management. So all of these decisions are very, very critical to pushing the company towards a bolder innovation effort. And then, of course, there's the process itself, the, uh, the innovation process, the idea to launch process, which we've already talked about. If it's not agile and, and, and uh, adaptive, etc., chances are uh, it's going to thwart, it's going to kill uh, bolder innovation. So you've got to have the right process in place, too. But all these pieces fit together plus the right climate and culture, led by the leadership team. So it's not just one thing, it's a, it's a number of pieces of the puzzle that have to go together to create a winning football team. Well, first of all, there's agile product development as it's being used in the software field. And I think I mentioned before that some of the principles, not all of them, but some of the principles from Agile in the software field can be applied in product development in the physical product world, uh, such as the uh, time box sprints, uh, the notion of concrete, deliver concrete results, deliverables that are results and not just PowerPoint presentations, and, and also the idea of, um, of building something that you can show people and get feedback, that fits in very nicely with the spiral development or iterative development that I talked about earlier, the adaptive aspect. Uh, basically what we're doing is taking some, some of the principles of Agile and building them into an already successful stage and gate process. Makes sense. Um, many people have argued that those principles can be applied to the, uh, if you're using the typical five stage, five gate, stage gate process, uh, those principles can be applied to the development phase, stage three, and the testing phase, stage four. Maybe some of the earlier stages, a little harder to apply those principles. Another place that I'm seeing um, the agile method used is where you have a company that does both kinds of development work. Um, a company like in Sweden, Ericsson, uh, they make systems, electronic systems for uh, cell phone communication, mobile phone communication, but they also develop the IT for the system. So here you've got a group of IT guys using Agile and a group of physical product developers making hardware uh, using a stage and gate process, their version of a stage and gate process. And they don't talk to each other. They say, use our method, use our method, and there's a lot of conflict and consternation. Finally, the big boss got them together and said, integrate the two. And so they've been able to integrate the two. They're not in conflict. They, they fit very, very nicely. Agile is a project management method that fits very well in a, within a stage and gate process. And I've seen that happen in a number of other companies as well. At first, they think it's, it's in conflict. Absolutely not. Not when you take a hard look at it. Right. And there's been papers written on this and I'm glad to see that people are overcoming that conflict and saying, hey, they work very, they're very, very compatible. So the combination of both, combination uh, do, of both. do bring value add to the project, Absolute. project life cycle. Absolutely. I think companies are facing a lot of the same problems they faced many years ago. Uh, resource management is a huge problem. And I'm glad to see that software suppliers such as yourselves are um, uh, coming up with solutions in the area of resource management. Uh, I've written several articles over the years. One was called The Resource Crunch in Product Development. And the, the analysis revealed that um, many of the ailments, many of the problems in product development can be directly traced to too many projects, not enough resources to do them properly. And that, that starts to impact on everything from um, we didn't do a voice of customer study because we just didn't have time. We put together a business case based on a lot of assumptions because we didn't have time to check it out. It was just so, so stressed, so thinly spread. And, 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 and it all boils down to resources, doesn't it? Uh, they didn't have enough resources on the darn project team or they were too busy doing other things. So I think this area of resource management has got to be one of the areas of the future. 
Uh, and I'm glad to see you guys working on that very, very diligently. Solve that problem, you solve 50% of what ails product development. You'll also solve the problem of time, acceleration. If you want projects done faster, staff up. Uh, one of the things I've seen is companies that are developing new methodologies, they always put a f footnote in there saying, an oh yes, it's a dedicated project team. This is their job full time. They're not working on five other projects. And that seems to be a given you know, if you want to really accelerate projects. So resource management would be a key one. I think another area of what's coming next is, um, is um, getting back to bolder innovation. The last 15 years have seen major corporations, major companies globally, move away from the kind of innovation that built the companies in the first place. It's sort of sad, you know, companies were very often built on the basis of a of, a, of an owner or entrepreneur or founder that came up with some aha. You know, like a Hewlett and a Packard that came up with the first test instruments. And now look at the mess Hewlett Packard's in today. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, or, 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 or uh, you know, uh, countless companies. It seems to be the, 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 the owners or the, the creators of the company had some big ideas and built the company. And slowly but surely over time, this tradition has been lost. And, and it is a fact, and there's heavy documented evidence on this, that major companies have moved away from true innovation percentage-wise, you know, they're doing less and less as a percent of the total than they did 15 and 20 years ago, and certainly less than they did when they first started. So I think, I think people, we've got to get back and rediscover bold innovation, true innovation. Uh, if these companies want to, you know, regain the strength, the power, the prosperity that they had in the earlier days. Times are tough. And there's one way for sure that people can deal with tough times, and that's innovate. And I don't think we're do doing enough of it. Some companies are, but most of us aren't. So bold innovation would be the second big area. Resource management, bold innovation to get back to the way we played the game when we were really winning the game. I think those are two things that we're going to see in the future. I hope.